Good afternoon to everyone. Uh, thanks for being here. This is the symposium on stereotactic radiosurgery and body radiotherapy. Thanks for braving the uh, cold weather and snow outside to be here. Appreciate that. So we have uh, three expert panelists today uh, that are going to tell us about various aspects of SRS and SBRT. Uh, Dr. Stan Benedict is the uh, chair of the AAPM Task Group 101, which, uh, as you know, is the standard of care guidelines for uh, practice of uh, SRS and SBRT. And he'll be telling, uh, giving us an introduction on this technology and some recommendations um, of his task group report. Dr. Solberg's work in stereotactic radiosurgery has been pioneering, and he's uh, actually the chair also of, a, of the ASTRO uh, Committee on uh, Safety and Quality Recommendations for SRS and SBRT, which will be published soon in the um, Journal of, or, or the Practical Radiation Oncology Journal, PRO. And finally, uh, Dr. Jeffrey doesn't need any introduction. He's a world-renowned expert in imaging. As you know, in addition to his uh, numerous accolades, He's, I should tell you, the uh, incoming uh, president of the Society of Rockstar Physicists. Uh, and incidentally, uh, Tim Solberg is the outgoing president. So, um, so we have two presidents. We should be lucky. So with that, let's begin. Stan, thank you. Great, thank you very much. So I'm actually going to be doing a, an introduction of uh, stereotactic radiation therapy and, uh, and a very brief uh, overview on some of the recommendations that came out in last year's published task group number 101. Um, I do have a couple of disclosures that the University of Virginia and the Department of Radiation Oncology has received some funding and grants from Electa, Varian, and Tomotherapy. I'd like to begin uh, for these uh, introductions to kind of go over a couple of questions, just uh, I think it's kind of helpful. First of all, is, is stereotactic body radiation therapy anything that's a single fraction? No, that's definitely not the case. Is it a treatment with N fractions and N is your choice? No. Is it whenever you are treating a small target? Well, uh, we treat lots of small targets and things, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's stereotactic radiation therapy, so no. Is it any treatment that uses image guidance? And uh, by the way, I, a lot of these questions I came up with because people call me about this. And so I just wanted to kind of bring them up. Is it any treatment that uses... No, absolutely not. We have lots of conventional treatment that use all kinds of image guidance. So stereotactic um, doesn't mean that you're just... Just because you use image guidance doesn't mean it's stereotactic. Is it any treatment that uses a stereotactic frame? Well, no. Actually... Um, stereotactic frames have been employed for conventional treatments a lot, and so that um, and they could be used in a lot of different ways. That in and of itself does not entail being stereotactic. Is it any treatment, and this is a real important one, is it any treatment on, an, I should say, a LINAC claiming that it has stereotactic capability? No again. So, well, we came up with a table, and I thought this was an instructive little table, and I wanted to go, kind of go through different categories on this for this introduction, uh, sort of differentiating between conventional radiation therapy and stereotactic, in, in this case, stereotactic body radiation therapy. So the dose per fraction for a conventional RT is generally 1.8 to about 3 gray, and our committee agreed that, in general, stereotactic body radiation therapy is probably somewhere between the range of 6 to 30 gray. Number of fractions, conventional is generally from 10 to 30. In this country, for billing purposes, stereotactic radiation therapy is 1 to 5 fractions. Stereotactic radiosurgery would be one, one fraction. Um, what is the target definition? Well, in conventional radiation therapy, we've got all kinds of things that we employ from uh, ICRU, et cetera, um, in, in terms of uh, clinical target volumes and planning target volumes. But in general, for stereotactic, the gross tumor volume, the clinical target volume, et cetera, are pretty much well-defined. And in fact, the gross tumor volume and the clinical target volume are about the same, or are the same. Margin. Margin for, um, for conventional therapy, we're, we're talking centimeters. And the margin for stereotactic body radiation therapy in general is going to be millimeters. Um, physics dosimetry monitoring, very important for us. It's, it's relatively indirect for conventional radiation therapy. We're not really at the machine for those types of treatments and monitoring it directly. We do, and I'm going to go over this very briefly, direct monitoring of physics and dosimetry for SBRT. 
um, required setup accuracy. This is not a complete list here of TG40 and TG142. Um, there are obviously a lot of other documents out there, TG68 um, on uh, f- uh, frames, etc. But um, no, it's still very important. Um, primary imaging. In most conventional radiation therapy, these days, it's CT. And in, for SBRT, it's considered that you're generally going to be using multimodalities, uh, CT, MRI, PET, etc. A couple more here. Redundancy and geometric verification. Making sure that you're in the right spot. In conventional radiation therapy, and generally, we don't have that. SBRT, we do. Um, maintenance of high spatial targeting accuracy for the entire treatment. Um, it's moderately enforced in conventional radiation therapy, and it's strictly enforced in SBRT. Need for respiratory motion management is relatively moderate in conventional radiation therapy. For for stereotactic, again, it's in its highest level. Last but not least on this, and this is real important because the theme for this whole uh, um, session is on quality assurance and safety. So staff training. Under no circumstances is conventional radiation therapy lower. It's still at the highest level, and we have a lot of respect for that. However, with a stereotactic, you have your high level of training plus some additional specialized training. Um, technology implementation, in both cases, high levels. Um, radiobiological understanding, well, we've got many, many decades of uh, doing conventional radiation therapy, and only a few, only about one or one and a half with uh, SBRT. And last, with uh, um, interaction with systemic therapies, chemo, etc., this is something that's, that this needs to also be investigated. So I thought that was a helpful um, introduction. So what is SBRT? It's basically a combination of our 50- or 60-year-old field of stereotactic radiosurgery using gamma knife, etc., combined with IMRT and conformal 3D delivery techniques and also image guidance, and it resides somewhere in the middle. So a very brief review of this uh, Task Group 101, and again, it came out in August of this last year, so I strongly encourage um, uh, people to check it out. This is a document that had a lot of different reviewers and uh, authors, and uh, some of the topics that are in it, I'm just going to go over... I'm not going to spend a lot of time because I only have a few minutes, but uh, major topics that are covered in are the history and rationale for SBRT, the current status of SBRT patient selection criteria, and some of the protocols. It has um, some of the simulation, imaging, and treatment planning. Um, It covers patient positioning, immobilization, target localization, and delivery, and special dosimetry considerations. And this is actually a very important section to it, is how do you implement um, stereotactic body radiation therapy in your clinic? Since I don't have time to cover the whole document, I'm just going to cover, oh, and also it has some few directions. I'm just going to cover a couple of brief topics that I think are, let's call them maybe some gotchas, that I think are important. And I'm just going to cover these real briefly. Participation in uh, SBRT clinical trials. I'll go on a couple of slides there. I want to talk a little bit about in the um, report are some normal tissue tolerances that you can use for planning purposes, something we really wanted to have in there. Normalized tumor doses, just to highlight that what we're delivering is a lot different from what what we're used to in conventional. A little bit about patient immobilization, and then some uh, aspects on time and personnel. So, big theme here. The most effective way to further the radiation oncology community's SBRT knowledge base is through participation in formal group trials. And so that is something that everyone on the committee and that is it wherever possible, even in community clinics, if you can follow or participate in a trial, that is the best approach. Um, that can be single or multi-institution. Um, ideally, it would be nice if it's an NCI or NCI cooperative group. And uh, if no formal trial, please look to publications. I know there's an awful lot going on out there in terms of SBRT, and I trust that uh, that's, it's being done in accordance with the publications. Um, so, and also, very, we we'll strongly recommend it to uh, structure as an internal clinical trial. Okay, just a very brief about uh, normal tissue tolerances. Normal tissue dose tolerances in the context of stereotactic body radiation therapy are still evolving. So there's a big amount of caution here that is needed in terms of what we know. Um, if you're part, if part of an IRB approved phase one protocol, please proceed carefully. Um, I always appreciate when there are SBRT talks 
well, by the physicians, and they show lots of gotchas. They all have their list of patients that have had some incident. And these, this is how we learn. Um, otherwise, the evolving peer literature must clearly be respected. Um, so in the report are, uh, again, a, a, a table of normal tissue tolerances, and uh, I just wanted to bring up that there's a couple of caveats to this, just to underscore this. Um, again, sparse, long-term follow-up is needed. Um, the data should be treated as a first approximation. Just because it's published and peer-reviewed, we are not 100% confident of all the values that we have in there. Doses are mostly unvalidated, but um, based on observation and theory. And there is some measure of educated guessing, to be perfectly honest. This is effectively what's in the report. Um, so normal tissue tolerances for, for serial tissue, um, and such as uh, optic pathway, uh, brain stem, spinal cord, rectum. And also normal tissue tolerances for parallel uh, organs, such as uh, lung and liver and kidney. I won't go into the detail. They're listed there for one fraction and five fractions. I should bring it up that there was a, a, a review of the paper, and they wanted us to put in eight fractions. Well, we're defining SBRT and stereotactic as one to five fractions, so there was no need to go to any, anything further than that. Although I think, in terms of study, and uh, that's that's a very fascinating thing to continue on with that. Uh, hypofractionated courses of therapy is a, something that's going to be of great interest. I think of continuing great interest. Um, just to underscore biological effects, not the same as uh, traditional radiation therapy, and certainly um, this is another. This is in terms of the safety and quality assurance. We just want to make sure that you cannot extrapolate from the linear quadratic model. Um, included in the report are some biological dose equivalents um, done by uh, as a normalized tissue doses. And uh, that just allows us to kind of highlight the difference between, say, oh, it should be uh, 30 and, well, anyway, in any case, uh, 30, 30 fractions times 2, and this is uh, 3 fractions at 22 gray, and you can see the NTD difference. There's 60 gray versus 330 gray. So we are talking substantially higher dose equivalents. Just a very brief amount on uh, managing tumor motion. Everything's moving. I like showing this slide because on the upper um, center you can see even the spinal cord moves around. This is done from some MRI cine. So just a couple of quick um, safety precautions that I wanted to highlight from the report. Simulation with motion or imaging artifacts. This is the recommendations from the report. If target and or critical structures cannot be localized accurately due to motion or metal artifacts, then you shouldn't be doing SBRT. Um, and I think that's an important consideration. Um, for SBRT, image-guided localization techniques shall be used to guarantee the spatial accuracy of the derived dose distribution. This is important. And as you remember, I listed, if you do use a stereotactic frame, does that mean this is stereotactic? <clears throat> and at this point in time, a frame alone is not adequate for providing SBRT. It should have image guidance. That's the good thing, and that's why we have Dr. Jaffrey holding us up the, the tail end of this talk here. We'll be providing lots of insight site on image guidance. So they cannot be, although this field started off with a lots of uh, different frames um, for immobilization, they are helpful, but they're more the coarse gain and not the fine gain of what we do in, in terms of setting patients up. So it's crucial to maintain spatial accuracy throughout the treatment delivery, and that can uh, uh, require integrated image-based monitoring. Some kinds of aggressive immobilization still continues to be used. It's just that not that as a sole means. I want to bring up this particular device, which was uh, really begat the whole field of SBRT, and I can feel good about it. It's a, a device that the Lecta made, and, uh, but it is no longer... Uh, made, no longer sold, no longer serviced, etc. But it was a very, very popular device. And I bring this up because uh, there's a growing trend, I think, for a lot of people to, who still want to use some kind of a frame or a mobilization device. And in fact, I'm thinking about starting a, a little working group on just, actually, I've got the beginnings of a little working group on just that very topic. Um, it, we don't want to necessarily go away from some kind of a frame. And again, it's not the sole source. We still rely on image guidance. But this, this particular frame, again, is no longer available. 
Last, on uh, respiratory motion management for thoracic and abdominal targets, a patient-specific tumor motion assessment is recommended. It quantifies motion expected over a respiratory cycle and determines if techniques such as respiratory gating would be beneficial and helps in defining margins for treatment planning. And it also allows for compensation for temporal phase shifts between tumor motion and uh, respiratory cycle. Here's my last slide. And I just want to bring this up, that for single fraction, this is uh, in terms of personnel, and this is something you have to keep in mind, for single fraction stereotactic radiosurgery, it is recommended that the physicist is present for the entire procedure, much the same as gamma knife. For multi-fraction stereotactic radiation, uh, actually that should be uh, stereotactic radiotherapy, the physicist should be present for the first fraction and at the setup of remaining fractions. And for SBRT, the physicist, again, should be present for a first fraction and set up for every fraction to verify imaging, registration, gating, and immobilization. Um, we have in the report defined what uh, being available is versus direct monitoring. All of those things are outlined and uh, should be considered. Oops. So that's uh, going to lead to the next talk here from uh, the good Dr. Solberg. I think what we'll probably want to do is take questions at the end to make sure we can get all the uh, uh, talks in. And I'll let him take it from there.